Uh, so welcome everyone to Jazz Chat with uh, David Friesen. And today we have really a very, very special um, musician uh, that I've played with and, and listened to for several years, Scott Wendholt. He's an articulate, passionate and lyrical trumpeter who approaches music with energy and spirit. He has recorded and or worked with artists including Kenny Garrett, Cyrus Chestnut, Christian McBride, Don Braden, and Bruce Barth. And for six years, Scott had found a home with Vincent Herring's Quintet. And this highly acclaimed band has recorded three albums, including folk Folklore, Live at the Village Vanguard. He has toured extensively throughout the United States, Europe, South America, Africa, and Japan with these bands, as well as others. To his credit, Scott has been recorded on more than 40 CDs, However, he is recognized as a leader as well. His list of credits include the Carnegie Hall Big Band led by John Faddis, Maria Schneider Big Band, the Bob Mincer Big Band, and the Buddy Rich Big Band. He has also had the honor of having been a member of the uh, Vanguard Jazz Orchestra, formerly the Thad Jones Mel Lewis Big Band for the last decade. Mr. Wendholt continues to be in demand on the playing scene as well as in the educational arena. Scott is currently on the faculty at the Manhattan School of Music and teaches at the Jamie Ebersole summer, ja summer Jazz Camps. He is also in demand as a, a player and clinician in many colleges and various other learning institutions around the world. And if any of this is untrue, Scott, you can correct me now on the spot. Of, but welcome to uh, Jazz Chat with Thank David you. Friesen. Great to see you, man. Thank you, David. Great to see you. I, I will correct you. I just I think some of that comes from uh, resume stuff that's a bit dated. So it's weird to think now the Vanguard Jazz Orchestra, uh, for example, has been 25 years. Wow. And, and the amount of CDs luckily has gone up to something upwards of 100 if we go with jazz CDs. So that's wow. that's a little dated. But you know, a lot of this, a lot of the highlights that you mentioned are. Still, things that I would consider highlights of you're still famous career. and you're yes, still great, correct? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that, that hasn't changed. <laughs> That's good, yeah. It's good, like Ted Kirsten used to say, it's better to be appearing than disappearing, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so, um, my first question to you is, is a question I ask everyone, uh, due to the times that we're living in, how and everyone has a different answer, you know, it's interesting how everyone copes with it, but. How did you cope with the pandemic and what we all went through here in the past year? Well, uh, I don't know. You know, that's how have I? I mean, that's it's a that's a tough answer for me. Um, uh, I at the very beginning of it when we weren't sure how long it would last, I kind of took some time away from the horn, and it felt great. You know, it was like I just feel like I've been slogging it out for decades, which is good. But, you know, very busy, and trumpet is very demanding at a high level. It's very demanding. So I really enjoyed kind of saying, all right, back off and just not practice for a while. And that felt good until it looked like this thing was going to go on a long time, and then it started to feel terrible. So I got, I got back to playing and at least doing my trumpet routine every day, and I'm trying to stay. I haven't been really creative as a writer i know you've been doing more than that it sounds like um yeah. i've sort of mm, i'm tough with without a, a goal project in in sight i tend to wait till those opportunities are are on the horizon to do it so yeah. that's something I, I kind of i fault myself for that a bit i wish i was a little more self-motivated to say wait a minute have some time every day to uh to nurture the writing thing the other aspect that you complain about when you're so busy you, you can't you can't be lazy when you play jazz trumpet you can't be lazy as a jazz musician so laziness is not a part of it i think it's just your body uh is telling you what to do and you're 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 just associating with the situation as it is you know yeah so everyone has a different i don't think there's a right or wrong here yeah. um but I guess it's it's typical that you know we all uh, 
well, I don't know, maybe not fault ourselves, but because that's a tough word, but we all do, you know, be, we try to be introspective and especially when talking to others and or teaching when I say, hey, you should be writing more often. And I know of what I speak because I don't do it enough. So I try to I try to be honest, you know. Uh, with do it. as so, I say, don't do as I do. Right? Sometimes, sometimes. And so we have to see that as sort of something that we 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 have to make uh, uh, we have to make uh, peace with. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Either, either by doing it more or saying, hey, that's the way I am. You know, what's your history? How did you when did you start playing music and why the trumpet? Well, that is kind of an interesting thing because I always, I don't know what your answer is, but many of us say, oh man, I heard this or that. And I said, I've got to do that or something, you know, something that really kind of hits you like a lightning bolt. Mine was much simpler in third grade. Uh, the teacher, Linda Walker came by and she said, oh, you remember her and, name uh, because she was fantastic. Wow. She was, she's a great educator and a dear, dear person. Great. But so I didn't know her at the time yet. Um, and she said, we're starting band. So, you know, sign up. It's really fun. And, and my friend Chris Curtis was sitting next to me and he said, oh, man, you should play trumpet. I do. It's fun. And I was like, OK. Uh, so I, signed, I, I said to Miss, Mrs. Walker, I said, hey, um, I would like to play trumpet. She's like, oh, great. And, you know, so I went home to my mom. My dad was out of town. He's an airline pilot. So he was on a, on a flight somewhere. And. I said, "Hey, mom, I need a I need a trumpet in three days." What you know? So, and she and then so we we talked to her and she said, "You know, your dad played trumpet." And I said, "Oh, uh -huh. I guess so." And I had always envisioned what my dad played as the sousaphone. I don't know because he was my dad, and I thought maybe the big instrument is what he would play. But I guess I sort of knew he played trumpet, but that wasn't the reason I chose it. So it was it was a real accident getting into it and. Uh, you know, Linda, like I said, Linda Walker was so great with all of us that we, she expected so much, but was so positive that we kind of all took off pretty quickly. So she was an influence for you, wasn't huge, she? Huge influence, yeah. Yeah. And I had, a, I had a, I think, was it fourth or fifth grade teacher named Miss Houlihan mm -hmm. that kind of opened up music for, for me. But actually, before when I was five years old, I heard a boogie woogie piano player come to my house and I was playing with my toy trucks on the ground and and this person started playing the upright piano and I stopped playing with my toy trucks and when he went I went to the piano and tried to emulate what I had heard and I never played with those toy trucks again See, I, was I, li I like your I like your story better you know, I, wish, <laughs> I mean because that's that's it's more romantic you know in a way I like that story mine was just it was just kind of I not to yep. say I did. I, I, there were a lot of moments in my life where I was, you know, greatly influenced and and tickled by what I was hearing, but not at the beginning. It was just kind of an accidental. Uh... Yours is very heartfelt and true. It's, I, I really could associate with that. Um, what about influences? Who influenced you on trumpet? Well, I don't know. I like to say that my main, you know, there's so many, right, for all of us. But if I if I had to break it down to my favorite jazz musician in the world it would be miles davis he was a big influence on me um but even earlier than that probably clifford brown because somebody in the know said hey you should check out this guy clifford brown i was like who how do you spell it okay so we got something to to transcribe that was also something i was like what's transcribing and it didn't it didn't occur to me that you could even do such a thing you hear you know write down what you were hearing so i kind of that got me into clifford brown maybe in 10th grade or something so Clifford, early on, Miles, more importantly, um, Woody Shaw hit me pretty square between the eyes when I was in college. Um, Freddie Hubbard as well. There, were t there was a time where I tried to sound more like Freddie than Miles because I wanted to kind of shed some of that um, miles -less things. And so I, I remember kind of staying clear of Miles for a while to, to absorb more Freddie. So those would be like some of the main ones, I'd say. Freddie was uh, incredible. I remember we were doing a concert once up in Canada, and it was Joe Farrell, um, uh, um, Freddie Hubbard, myself, Mike Knock on piano. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think, Eddie Marshall maybe on drums. And I remember, I remember before we went on, um, Joe Farrell was telling me. He says, uh, "Freddie starts." at this level, which is the level I try to get to by the end of the night. 
<laughs> and then he takes it on up. Right. Yeah. That, <laughs> amazing, was, amazing player. Yeah, he was one of those guys. I mean, you mentioned Vincent Herring. He was he's somebody I have have a still good relationship with. But musically, we're we're um, you know, playing all the time for the many years and 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 he played with freddie and was on the same bandstand he said of all the people i'm paraphrasing of course but of all the people the he had greats that he had been like in a reasonable proximity right next to he said nobody compared to freddie and it just like the, yeah. the sound the energy the whole vibe there was yeah. just something more there from freddie did you ever get into booker little I did, yeah. I love Booker Little. I he was somebody that there's some things that are in his were in his wheelhouse that that I just can't do. Like some of this, like even the tempos he was playing at 19 years old or 20 years old, and, and the, the straight eighth feel that he had and the tempos he was able to play, I still can't quite cop that. It's like beyond my uh, ability level. But I but loved the, him as a player. But the spirit of the music. See that the reason I asked you that. It's because when I hear you play, Booker Little name jumps out at me. Mm, thanks. Well, that's a, that's a compliment in my direction. I, uh, yeah. You know, I I think that might something about Booker Little, who had a, a short life, uh, unfortunately, but he really did go a lot of places in a short time in terms of uh, approach and uh concept of you know he got you know it got pretty outside and started very inside and in a short career i can't tell you how many years you would call his career but it was compared to freddie hubbard even uh miles davis much much shorter so that was did, an inspirational thing did you a practice um a play classical music i did i i was lucky enough to always from day one study with classical teachers which I would say helped me a lot and I was in a great orchestra from seventh grade through twelfth in Denver, Colorado, where I grew up, called the Young Artist Orchestra, and it was like I was in over my head. I was a very good little player, but I remember the first year I was in seventh grade and the rest of the brass section was all in college. So they skipped high school, you know, and like so I was kind of in a all of a sudden a a very foreign area. And some of the some of the players there were kind of not into it and others including Jeannie Downing I remember her name she was just so supportive she was uh, playing the principal chair I think that first year and I was playing whatever third fourth trumpet and uh, she was very very helpful so that that situation for me was very beneficial not so much as a trumpet player but even just as well that too but as a musician learning all of the repertoire that I did yeah. in that six years and you know classical music it, it teaches you to get a sound out of, out of the instrument, right? Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, you must have come across, if you're from Denver, um, what is the name of that jazz club? Funny. Uh, uh, you mean the, Dazzle now or El no. Chapultepec? Yeah, that one there. I played yeah. there once years ago and I'm into boxing and I met the, oh, what's his name? Uh, Jerry, I think. Uh, no, uh, senior no, you're, not ta you're not talking about the owner of the club. Uh, no. Who was, okay. I met him back in the pool room okay. and and I saw the fight that he was in. He was a heavyweight contender. I mean, uh, but, but anyways, you must've run into Paul Warburton uh, sure. yeah. and, and Joe Close. I don't know if you know those names. I don't know the second one, but you know, I was sort of not on the scene in Denver, you know, uh, a little bit because I was a good little player, but you know, going to high school there, you know, kind of running track and playing in the band and this and that, you know, but I wasn't really on the professional scene ever there. So some cats, I do not know when you, uh, who are fixtures, you know. When you say running, <laughs> when you say running track, it's funny because <laughs> Art Farmer and Frank Foster and I were working one time in, in Canada and Art was telling me that him and Frank in New York would play on the street corners and they made a pretty good living. And he said the police would come and chase them and they'd be running oh my God. <laughs> down the street. <laughs> of course. Wow. That's, that's so really, uh... track, you know, running track training, that's probably, you know, good for jazz musicians. <laughs> it, it can all go hand in hand. I thought you were going to go a different direction. You know, this is kind of a neat story. I was like, uh, I remember being on the... Uh, SS Norway uh, for a jazz cruise years ago. I was on there with the uh, 
the band of Maria Schneider and John Fedchuk when they had the band together. So it's going back to about 1990 or 91 or something. And Lou Donaldson was on the, the cruise. And I remember, you know, being in awe, of course, right, rightly so. And one time he was on the, on, the, on the sun deck and he was getting some sun. And he had a, like a, you know, a, quite a gathering, just talking to cats. And I was sort of a fly on the wall near him. And I was like, oh, I got closer. And I was like, I want to hear what he's talking about. You know, like, yeah. ready to hear, like, oh, the cats and this and that. And when, I, when we did this, and, when, and I remember getting close enough to hear him say, man, I just want to get back so I can go play golf. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and, and I thought of golf as the anti-jazz thing to do. But of course it's not. Why would it be? You know, he yeah. can do whatever he wants with his life. Uh, but it, it was an interesting. So, yeah, track, uh, jazz, <laughs> golf, jazz. Why not? All that stuff. What does it take, in your opinion, what does it take to make a great player? Not just a good player. What does it take to make a great player? I don't know. That's it's a that's a good question and a tough one. Um, I remember thinking about this as the question was sort of posited as well. At I don't know if it was a class at Indiana University that David Baker might have posed this question, or if we just were talking about it amongst ourselves. But I think it was David that did that spurred our conversation away from the class. But he was saying that really great players have to be virtuosos on their instrument. And I was kind of like, well, I don't know about that, because that sounds like, you know, if you're a really spectacular, you know, uh, let's say um, fiery player or something, I kind of looked at it that way. And I, David didn't say it quite that way, but I think, you know, there's a lot to that. And to be a virtuoso, virtuoso doesn't always mean flashy, right? It means being... I think being as close to at one with your instrument as you can be, among other things. But I think that's pretty basic. That is the the closer we can get to what we hear and can sing in any key, say, with no problem. You have to be pretty at one with your instrument. And on trumpet, that's even harder than some other instruments. It's such an asymmetrical. Uh, balance between yourself and the, the way you coax notes like your instrument very symmetrical so you take you can go up a half step and it still kind of feels like not to say it's super easy there's different you know things you have to do that i don't even know about i'm going to steal that lick by the way thank yeah. you <laughs> you got it I, I want full credit for that one though um, well, i'll give it to you <laughs> but trumpet when you learn then you go up a half step you got nothing that you've just learned you've got nothing to go on with you know, yeah. You know, chop wise, yeah, a little bit, but so the trumpet to get at one with, well, at least it's a fair playing field. We're all playing the trumpet trumpeters, but it's a hard struggle. So that's one of the big, that's one of the main things I think about being a great, uh, great player. Because you didn't even say great artist. I like it, right? You asked about great player. I like that. Um, yeah, that's one of the things though that I, I may not have had enough appreciation for when I was younger. Yeah, that's a good that's a good answer. Everyone has kind of a different approach to, to that question. I don't think I don't think it's right or wrong. It's just how we each view it. Well, you know? mine's right, but I yeah, of course, <laughs> <laughs> of course, you, you, you're till, still teaching at Manhattan School of Music. I am. We're on break now. Of course, it's the summer, but I'll be back uh, for the fall semester. And yeah, I don't know. I think I'll have a couple students in a combo at this time. It kind of ebbs and flows. Sometimes I'm super busy. Sometimes not, but well, I, I remember coming in one time and doing a clinic there um, one day uh, for Tomasti Kinfield. They were sponsoring me, going around a lot to a lot of different institutions, uh, sharing uh, what I know about jazz and trying to help students. And I found the Manhattan School of Music. I can usually gauge what kind of uh, teaching they're getting by the enthusiasm of the musicians and by the questions they ask. Mm. Uh, and I found it very uplifting at the Manhattan School of Music. I really consider it one of, the, uh, at that time, and it probably still is, one of the great schools to go to for uh, learning. It is. I mean, I think the culture there is very good overall. And uh, the appreciation for 
uh, the history and playing bebop and change playing and even as people want to move away from that, rightly so, I guess. But there seems to be a pretty good overall um, focus on enough things. I remember, you know, at Indiana University, I, I, I fault my experience there a little bit that I didn't, somehow I didn't become much of a writer arranger and I slipped through the cracks. I'm sure they told me I, and they were trying to make me be one. But I see at Manhattan School of Music that would not fly at all. It's just the culture is no, everyone does this, everyone learns this. You need to get all these aspects of being a jazz artist uh, to a high level. So I, I appreciate that about the environment there. Any special students that stand out right now? Ah, man, I mean, your opinion? yeah, I mean, I have this kid, his name is Henry Sherris. He's from New Zealand. He's a freshman who I met there when he was in high school. And I was doing a, you know, a special guest thing with a band over there throughout that beautiful country. Um, he's really showing some great things already as a freshman. He's super devoted and dedicated. Um, I have a student who was a master student of mine. Uh, his name's Stuart Mack, and he's, uh, been on the scene now for say two or three years and he's doing great he's somebody that i'm like checking in with and you know making you know we we keep in touch and he's kind of doing everything sort of like i do you know he's doing some broadway work he's doing some teaching he's doing some you name it uh and a great jazz player at the same time oh, that's great what about you what about the projects on the horizon uh, yeah for your know. I got to get some projects on the horizon. You know, I, I'm about to do another uh, recording project. Uh, I have a band. The, my, so my last CD, I guess I'll call it a record recording project. My last record um, was with a quartet which, without a piano. So it's uh, Ugana Okegwa on bass and Victor Lewis on drums. And uh, Victor. I, yeah, Victor's great. Yeah. And then, as, as is Ugana. And... I co-lead that band with a good friend, uh, saxophonist Adam Kolker. He's a tenor saxophone player. So we write stuff for that uh, for that band, and we're really do another thing. We got some new music happening, and we just got to, you know, probably just schedule a record date to get the darn thing going again. Do you still see Victor? I do. I'm I'm almost talked to him today. Uh, I missed his call, but I'm gonna get back in touch. I'm checking to see if he can make a gig we have coming up. We're great. The, so hopefully please give pass on my best to him we we've we've toured a couple of times in poland and recorded together and and uh i got the front seat because i was older than victor (laughs) well he's older now (laughs) i says victor the the elder gets the front seat says well i'm the elder i says well let me see your birth certificate (laughs) or he asked me for mine (laughs) He's, he's he's a great uh, great drummer. I really love Victor. He's a great Me person. Too. I think he's from Omaha, right? Nebraska. Yeah, he is from Nebraska. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, have you set for yourself any long term goals at all? Gosh, you know that's a, that's a good question. I used to fault myself for not having enough of them, but right now I don't. Uh, I don't have a. I want to keep just playing music at the highest level. I love to be a side man. I love to be a leader too, but I'm, David, I'm not, I've never been like really hell bent on having a career as a solo artist and become a famous jazz star or whatever. I mean, I like, I like notoriety. Everyone does, but it's not been a big uh, MO of mine. I, I realized some time ago to like really get out there and you know, have all these super goals that I want to make. So I kind of, I, I, I tend to bounce around a little more. And, and as long as I have something on the horizon that's really compelling or enough things on the horizon, then that kind of sustains me. And I seem to roll into situations that nurture me, if that's leading or getting called to do a record or someone else's or touring or whatnot. I have three questions. You're not a student of mine, but three three questions I ask my students when they come to the study with me, and there's no right or wrong answer. It's just how they see it. I ask them first, why are you playing music? Why? And then what are your musical needs? And then what are your musical goals? Mm-hmm. So it's I think I think goals are important. And I think what you just said was was really good you know i mean you don't want to be a out 
as a jazz soloist, jazz star, you're really content doing big band things and sideman things. You love playing the instrument. You can hear that and you can hear how great you play. You've mm-hmm. put in the time. Mm-hmm. So it comes out through your music. I think um, I like to think uh, having it in the back of my mind that yes, I want to be the best player that I can be. That means communicating to people with on various l- levels uh, depending on where the listener is, I guess. But I know that that's, I do want to be of the highest caliber, but I keep that sort of in the back of my mind and then know that whatever I come across, that's that's my guiding thing is back there. But, I, but in terms of like really making things happen, and I'm, talk, I'm very frank with my students. I say, hey, and your three questions are good because they you ask them to figure out sort of well what is what's your personality, and if I and if they say hey I'm a real go getter and I want to make this happen and I want to get out there and market myself I say well then go for it, that was not my mo and I, I had to deal with that is that okay that I'm not that way maybe I should be so you know you kind of make peace with it I think along the way, I think there's a lot of st- a lot of genuine stability in your answers you know I think it's going to be nice for a lot of uh, uh, musicians students to hear you share what you had to share today um, I, I usually conclude the the um, um, interview asking my um, my guest um, to uh, g- uh, give some words of hope in a world that's uh, with all these problems and, you know, there's so much going on right now, um, politically, um, all over the world. It's not just in America, I mean, everywhere. You, even up in, 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 in Alaska, in some igloo, I mean, they're having, <laughs> they're having these pandemic problems. Mm-hmm. Um, any words of hope? What would you, what, what could you share with folks? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, partially the pandemic uh, I, and I, you know, being something to overcome in a way, get through and have hope after or during. And also just looking at the political times uh, that are fraught with some difficulties, certainly in the United States and in, around the world. Um, I think it it kind of reassures me more than ever that I'm doing the right thing. So when I was young, I think my parents or one's parents could say, well, why don't you do something also, David, that, you know, in case music or whatever, that that, that is more guaranteed because we're worried for you. And they would have a pretty good, when we were kids, our parents might have had a pretty good argument saying, hey, why don't you do something that you can count on a little more? But now I look around, and it's been this way for a while, but it's certainly there now where you should really be doing what you want to do more than, maybe maybe that's always been true, but it's more true than ever because there are no guarantees and even if you do think you're going down a path that's more secure it might not be and then you don't want to be looking back and saying oh i I, I gambled wrong i thought this was going to be more secure so i'm a pragmatic person deep down but i still want to say to anyone thinking about the even being I, i don't know put off by it a little bit or the pandemic slowing things down it's still the time to say more than ever, I'm going to pursue and keep getting great at what I love to do. And the rest of the stuff, the pragmatic stuff, whatever, practical stuff, will take care of itself. You know, this verifies <laughs> why I love your playing. Because everything you've shared today, this last statement, in my opinion, from what I see, coincides exactly with the way you play music. The sound I hear coming out of your trumpet, the lines you play, for me, coincides perfectly with your answers and what you shared today. Well, that, that so, means a lot. Thank you. That's, that's a very, a, that's a very, that. that's a very special thing. For my uh, jazz chat fans out there, uh, please check out my David Fries and jazzeducation.net. It's an e-shop, a lot of really helpful tools there for you. Uh, I think you'll find interesting. Um, Please stay well. Um, 
be healthy and God bless you all. And thank you so much, Scott, for doing this interview and sharing with us a wealth of uh, great information you had for us today. Totally my pleasure, David. It's great to, great to catch up with you and great to see you again. Yeah, likewise. Thanks, man. thanks for having me. A pleasure. I hope we'll have a chance to play again sometime soon. We will. We will. <laughs> bye bye. All right, bye bye. Thank you.